And ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are live. Welcome to another episode of Camera and Flask. This one's going to be a lot of fun today. I'm really excited. Uh, but first, let's check in with the two gentlemen down there in the lower quadrant. Mr. Jem Schofield, how are you doing today? I, I am doing well, Mr. Caleb Pike. I'm uh, kind of in disbelief that I can almost see the middle of August of hashtag 2020 upon us. How is that even possible? And still going down is uh, one of, if not the strangest years of my life. But I'm doing fine. Hmm. I'm healthy and uh, kids are fine. Uh, family's fine. So good to be here. And the man in the yellow shirt, Ben Barden, what's going on, man? I'm kind of getting eaten by mosquitoes. We seem to have been plagued by them. So if you see me kind of grabbing around, I think I was doing oh, they're this in, last they're week. They're up in the house now too, huh? Not so many. We've got nets over all the windows all the time. Is but, that, wow. Nets? Is that, is wow. that bad? Or is that what you just guys Every year. Every, everyone has them here. Uh, maybe that's what we call screens. Good grief. Why do you live you, there? I don't know. It sounds awful. Are you near <laughs> standing no, water? Or what's going on? Are you near... No. A, when, oh. It's not normally this bad. It's just generally to stop flies, not mosquitoes kind of coming in in the summer. But, mm. uh, yeah, they're, they're everywhere. It's been raining and then getting hot, and then they all come out of the woodwork and just attack you. So You're like the main of Europe. Here. You're like the main of Europe. Maine is horrible with is, mosquitoes is, in the summer. Uh, horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Mm. We're mm. a long way from the sea, though. We're kind of like about as far away from the sea as it's possible to get. So I don't know. Things are... That's odd. Yeah, it is. It is. It's weird this year, but everything's weird this year, as you were saying. Yeah, right. Every, the weather's been weird. Like the stuff in the gardens died. There's like other stuffs grown that I've never seen before. Everything's just a mess this year. So we'll just put it down to that and move on. But has has the uh, has the meth production in the Czech Republic gone down because of 2020, or do you think it's gone up? I think volume's gone up. Quality apparently. So I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, <laughs> why don't we first address the gentleman I'm seeing here in the chat that we have so far, including David, Harrison, Andre, Jake, and Sam. Good to see you, gentlemen. Um, this is going to be a fun one. So before we dive in, because we've got a lot to cover, uh, why don't we talk about what we are sipping on this evening, starting with, uh, we'll start with Jim. What are you drinking? Uh, audio? Audio? Audio, Unless I'm not meet, hearing. Meet, I'm meet. trying to make the dog <laughs> shut up. Is. I'm trying to tell people to make the dog shut up. Uh, wow. <laughs> Rabbit Tribble. The names just get better and better. Coming in right behind Small Brown Fox. My just going with the Glen. are amazing. I'm going with the Glen Livet here. This is the one that is aged in the uh, Caribbean rum casks. I've had it before. It seemed like uh, the type of afternoon to have it. I, I would almost consider, because it's warm outside, putting something on ice, but I, I wouldn't do that to a lovely scotch. So there we go. That's what I'm having. Pretty Very good. nice. And uh, Ben, what, what you got for us? I'm on the cooking whiskey. Um, so this is the, the little Queen Margot. That I'm always generally drinking at this time of day, other than last week when I was drinking beer, but I'm yes. slightly more sober than I was last week, so this is just a, a more regular week, the kind of pre-bedtime whiskey. Nice. Delightful. What about you? What's it going to be, Mr. Caleb Pike? So this week, drinking? it is a more full bottle oh boy. of yeah. bullet Must have just come bourbon. Off the truck. Yeah. Now wow. that, you could have, that you could have with a little ice, maybe, but not necessarily. Yeah. How, you how old is that bottle? You call my whiskey trashy? Oi. Yeah. Um, he, he, opened it, he opened it when he was coming down the stairs, and he has had a little bit. <laughs> he just <laughs> took a swig. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Oh uh, David's All having right. a land shark lager. Uh, we've got a high from, oh, that's why. Formerly Larry. Larry, I don't want to ask. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, call the police. Someone's a Trekkie. Trekkie. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, rabbit but, dribble, fun times. And then here we go. We've got uh, Harrison, Andres, Jake, Sam, and uh, we're all hanging here. And we'll have some more people show up, I'm sure, because we're going to be talking about cameras. <sighs> all right, let's do this. Cheers, everyone in the chat. You oh, yeah. gentlemen. 
Here we go. And focus oh, is there it today. is. Okay. Well, that's come XT3. On, come on, come on. Maybe I should get the XT4. It's just so, <laughs> it's so pulsy. Mm, there we go. It's a, mm, that's oh. dirty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Delicious. All right. Mm. Let's we'll settle in. Wine for heart health for the choice. <sighs> nice. <clears throat> Good times. All right. So the topic this week is... Uh, we're going to go through various camera brands and talk about what would cause us to switch or what would we uh, require of a company to switch. So each of us, for those who don't know, kind of have a, you know, we lean one way or the other. I used to be a big Canon guy. I've been mainly Panasonic, a little bit of dusting of Sony um, for a while now. Gem has been Team Red for a long time, pretty much ever, I would say, predominantly. Sony, there's been some Sony in history. I mean, it depends on how far we go, right? And a lot of Fujifilm lately in the smaller cameras, right. for sure. But right. definitely Team Red in larger cameras, unless we're renting on the job and they get like that occasional Christmas present and we get to work with an Alexa. But yes, for mm -hmm. the most part, it's, yeah, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. And then Mr. Barden has been uh, Canon, then Sony, currently back to Canon, right? Mm hmm. Pretty much. I've shot with other things for certain jobs that have been rented in. But yeah, the, that's pretty much it. So when I started as a stills photographer, uh, yeah, I was Canon from from that point on. You know, yeah. when, when it's been, as soon as digital came along, I was Mamiya on medium format when I first started. But then as soon as Digi came in, I, I was Canon, yeah, until a little, the little for, detour into Sony. Yeah, and for Mini DV, I started with the Optura Pi from Canon, and then the big change was, and that was, wasn't really serious, and then the big change was the DVX100. Um, that's mm. when I really started to, and then I was uh, Panasonic until the EX1 came out, and then when the EX1 came out, that was my camera for a long time. And then I moved on to Canon, but with little uh, pepperings of other things, because both Ben and I had the FS700. And did you have a 100 as well, Ben? Did I have an FS100? No, just the 7. Just the 7, yep. So we both had the mm. 7. And then after that, it was selling the 700, which I actually bought for the high speed, for the overcranking. And it was Likewise. getting another C100. So I had two... And that's when I started down the road of having two matching cameras uh, whenever I could. But, yeah, so a big mix of things. Uh, and the X-T3 was a big surprise in my life. It really was a, mm. it was going to be an X-E3 for stills. And then they came out with the X-T3, and I bought that, and I was kind of shocked how good it was for video. Um, yeah, so lots nice. of cameras. Nice, all right. So let's do this. Let's go Ben, Jem, me. We'll just go in that circle there. Um, and uh, seeing more people in the chat. Good to see you guys. Um, let's begin with, let's see, who does none of us currently sh mainly shoot with? Why don't we start with Sony? Why don't we go big? Okay. All right. Uh, ben, let's start with you. What would Sony need to do to, on the cinema and mirrorless end, kind of make you, you know, sell all your Canon gear and move over? I think if you were in a position where you could just, and I, I guess this is the assumption that we're going to have to make, that you're going to have right. enough to be able to just flog everything and yeah. sort of be not financially ruining yourself moving into another system. Because obviously lenses are what kind of keeps yeah. us where we are to an extent, I think. We've yeah, let's go ahead and just time. say that you, you're at a spot, you've got 10 to 20 grand for cameras and lenses, Right you now, for each of these categories, you're starting fresh. What would yeah. Sony need to have available for you to be like, let's do this, gung ho? I mean, honestly, if I was right now, I think the thing is for me in the way that I work is, is that having a, a proper camera, so a, a cinema camera as we term them now, but something with proper audio inputs, ND on board, all of that. But I also need something that can do stills, really. And I need something that can, uh, can be used as a gimbal camera, be used as something smaller, travel stuff, that kind of thing. So at the moment, Sony's pretty, pretty much there, 
I think it would be a real, you know, if we were starting afresh and you're saying you've got nothing, where are you going? And Sony would be a, a really, a really strong prospect at the moment. I would say that would be the most likely. The, you know, there's the colour thing, but I think Sony's improved so much in that respect recently. I don't think that is the, the hurdle that it was for me. Um, I, th I think the new A7 I th uh, S, I think, is not going to be usable as a stills camera, really. The resolution's not there for, for the kind of stuff that I need that for. But they've a plethora of other cameras, the R range in that, which I used for a long time, uh, the Mark II, which was a great camera, really good. Um, but I didn't particularly like the colour on it, but in every other respect, features-wise, it was great. So I don't know, Sony right now, for me, it's, it's a whole system, which is what I'd need. Um, the lenses are great, and the AF works really well, which is something that, you know, again, back from four or five years ago, or even more recently, that wasn't necessarily a thing. Now I think I'd really struggle without that, particularly on the smaller cameras, and, and theirs has got good now. Um, yeah, good range of glass. Uh, great yeah, FX9, that kind of level of stuff would be ideal for me. And also, in some, some ways... That camera is such a sought after thing for for shooters. If if you know, broadcasters are wanting someone in, that's what they want you to have. So I I I think Sony's a strong prospect. I think I will be torn between the two. You know, if we were starting afresh right now, I'm not entirely mm. sure where I go, and we'll see what happens with the R series uh, ongoing if if they manage to sort that out to some degree. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I I would say Sony Sony have got it a, a good setup right now be very tempted nice jim what would sony have to do to to entice you well i mean i would say that sony always entices me i mean i have an, an original a7s mark one uh for a long time there i it almost felt like it was a 50 50 split between projects where i never owned a c300 mark ii but i was shooting between the c300 mark ii and the FS7 or the FS7 II for the productions I was doing for clients. It was sort of the most readily available owner-operator camera. It was e both of them, easy to source, and I would say it was really a split down the middle. And there were many times that I would recommend the FS7 and FS7 II to people over the C300 Mark II largely because of the off-speed recording. It was a, a much sharper camera in general, but for high-speed stuff, it was the way to go. So if you're a small production company and you were shooting music videos and you wanted to do some overcrank stuff for commercials and stuff like that, it was a great camera. So now we kind of have the evolution of that. We still have an FS7 II if you want a super 35-millimeter camera. You have the FX9 if you want full frame. Um, I do think that if you're comparing the two companies in the digital cinema camera space, Canon is really killing it right now with the C300 Mark III and the C500 Mark II. I think that that's, that's their space right now. And it doesn't mean that the FS7 II and the FX9 are not great cameras. I haven't shot with the FX9. I have a lot of experience with the FS7 series. But... Um, I don't know if I have Ibis on, Rabbit, Tribble, but it's probably the AF. This camera, who knows? We're going with it today. Uh, and the still shoot went well, by the way. So it really then comes down to the mirrorless cameras. And I'm kind of in this weird place right now where my digital cinema cameras are Canon. C100 Mark, you know, uh, ones, but the C200 camera. And then the... You know, in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, you know, the the mirrorless cameras, it's really XT3, XT4. So these are cameras that don't necessarily play well together. You know, they're different sensors. Uh, of course, what I'm going to have to do in general is dumb down, believe it or not, the higher end cameras to the Fujis, because these hmm. have 10 bit. I mean, obviously there's Cinema Raw Light in the C200, but I'm not shooting with that a lot. So, you know. It's it's a hard it's a hard thing to answer. I think that from what I'm seeing, the A7S III, when it comes to a mirrorless compact camera in that form factor, 
is going to be one of the best choices out there if what you want to do is shoot video. But I 1 million percent agree with Ben. It is not what I would consider a hybrid camera that I would invest in. I'm not buying that camera for stills and video. I would, even though I'm going to take a hit in terms of it being 8-bit and some other things, it's the a7 III that would win out, which is why I think the a7 IV would be really interesting. So if we're looking at a7 IV with the same formats and codecs and some of the features, but we have a higher megapixel camera, one of the things that I'm attracted to in a small camera system is the fact that I can use it as a hybrid system. And I'm doing more and more of that, like the X-T3 and X-T4 are now cameras I'm using with uh, off-camera flash with speed lights. I'm starting to do more strobe stuff and it, you know still stuff is actually starting to pick up in the business. So I'm thinking about that stuff a lot more seriously. But I think they've got a hit on their hands with the A7S III. I'm hoping that that sensor plays nicely with the A7, I'm sorry, the FX9 and the FS7 II. The question is, do the R6 and R5 sensors play well with the C200, the C500 Mark II, C300 Mark III? I don't know the answer to that. And that is, to me, really, because you posed the question, Caleb, the real, the real thing is, okay, can I, can I have a camera on a gimbal, you know, and can I also have A and B cameras for the other stuff I'm doing in the production, and do I have to drive myself crazy in post, or are these things going to work well together? And we know that they all have different sensors for the most part, though in theory the R6 has the same sensor as a 1DX Mark III. That's not a camera I'm going to shoot with, so that doesn't really matter to me. That was a really long and stupid answer in a way. I, but I, I think I, I hope what I am saying makes sense. So it, it, the short answer is probably not a lot if I felt like the A7S III or an A7 uh four would match well with a with an FS seven two and an FX nine. But I, I don't know if I'd make the whole switch. But yeah, that's where Got it. that's what yeah, yeah. Or maybe if some of like Sony's recent epicness translated to what we had d talked about in I think the last week. Uh in what did we say? FX five? If that came out to be like a C two hundred murderer or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. So maybe. yeah, we talked about that right at the end. That is really interesting. If you take the guts of the A7S III and you put that into an FS5 body, to me that would be a really interesting camera from Sony. That I think better would codex. Be uh, just the internal awful yeah. side handle that pinched Everything. your hand. Yeah, I mean, I I have never been a huge fan of the FS5 uh, ever. But if you had a camera that had the variable ND built-in XLR inputs, and you then added essentially everything from a recording standpoint that's in the A7S III, nobody would expect that camera to be a hybrid camera. And to me, right now, they could own that $5,000 space US in the digital cinema market. It doesn't mean that other people wouldn't buy the C200. I still think it's a great camera. But when you're talking about day in, day out recording, Nobody gives a hmm. rat's ass about RAW. You know, they really and want I, to have a good 10-bit codec at a decent data rate. So it'd be interesting to see if Sony did do that, because I, I think it, it, it would make an awful lot of sense for them to, because there's a bit of a gap in that market anyway. C200 has got its flaws in it because of the, the codec issue. It'd be interesting to see what Canon would do, whether that's then a new camera, which there's been rumors of this week with the RF mount potentially, Hmm. Or whether they would whether they would look at doing the firmware updates that they've been reluctant to do with the C200. And I'm not only talking about obviously the 10 bit that everyone's wanted, and we, we everyone knows that's probably not going to happen. But I'm talking about things like the AF system in it, which I think is because it came out and it was great, and then the system that's on the ESR and on the new cameras is amazing. And you know, could that be brought in to to just make the C200 a a, a better prospect and give it a little bit more life make that something that's that's saleable again the number of people in the facebook groups and the c200 facebook groups that are selling theirs right now it's insane if you want a c200 they're going for nothing yeah the market is absolutely it, swamped i think if canon put a, a 200 megabits per second 
10-bit codec into the C200. You know, we talked about the A7S III and what, what they needed to do to, to make that camera attractive to people. That would be a huge bump in that camera system. But yeah. the same token is is if we have, for, for certain periods of time, recording issues with the R5 when used as a video camera as opposed to a stills camera, um, we wouldn't necessarily have any of those issues in a camera body the size of the C200. So, no. you know, Canon could do the same thing that Sony would do and basically take the R5 and put that into a C200. Even if they took away the AK and they just had, and they put the sensor in there and you couldn't record 8K, but you could have a subsampled 4K image mm. from that 8K sensor. And then you put all of that stuff that's inside of the R5 and they got that into that five to six thousand dollar price range. That could be a home run as well, you know. That could really be something right. uh, interesting. Well, what do you think in terms of Sony? Because uh, you're already, you know, you're getting an well, A7S three. Now we that we're that. not talking about Sony at all. Oh, we got a donation. Oh, it is three come. euro super sticker pair character <sighs> punching the air with fist and something. Fist and bump. Switch fist bump. Knuckles. I can't see your thing. Got it. And um, uh, thank written you, on written on his knuckle. Oh, uh, punch in the air with fist and bump. So it's fist and bump written on his <laughs> knuckles. There you go. And just nice. before we move on, that we need to acknowledge I think there's some some issues that people are having tonight with the stream. I did uh, see that as well. We're, we're what back is to that? the old days. People are getting kicked off, apparently, it seems, and then having to come it, back it in. It sounds like a YouTube issue. I'm monitoring it, it on my end, and it's been smooth as butter the whole time. Yeah, let me just right. say that uh, YouTube has been a little strange all day. In fact, I said this in my earlier stream. When I was trying to update and add streams and do things like that, I was constantly getting kicked out. Like, I would change a word in my description and say save, and it would... I'd have to do it four or five times, reload the page. I think there's something going on with uh, YouTube and the interwebs. So there you go. Yeah, got it. Um, for me with Sony, I'm I'm really close to being there with the A7S uh, three. I keep wanting to say four because that's their current gen across the line. Yeah. Um, that's where we should be by now. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it just looks phenomenal. So to me, it's going to be how does uh, getting my hands on the footage with that 10-bit 422 internal, what is what is that like? What does it look like? Um, it looks, and my favorite video so far that I've seen uh, really giving you a taste of what the differences are has been Potato Jet's content yeah, I agree. on the, the 7 s 3 Yep, yep. He does a great, no one else really did that. They just showed footage but but he did a great job showing here's the old Sony color, here's the new Sony color, and it looks great. So if that um, grades well, all of that good stuff, there's a good chance I'm going to move over to that system fully. Uh, currently, I'm mainly Panasonic when it comes to production. I don't really do the cinema camera thing yet, um, just because all the capital is tied up in buying all these bloody mirrorless cameras that are coming out every five minutes. Yeah. Um, so that's the deal with Sony. Uh, I think the FX5, whatever that's going to be, could be really exciting. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, Baron dropping a $5 super chat. Let's bring it up. Uh, Let's read pricing it. Pricing switch from three GH5 setup with 10 lenses spanning 15 to 800 is not cheap. If the GH6 can nail <clears throat> AF and raw, I'm happy camper for now. Uh, a happy camper for now. Nice. Thank you for uh, the super Baron, chat, Good to see you, man. Good awesome. dude. Check out his yes. channel. He uh, has some pretty rad mandolin videos. That's his jam. So good. Good stuff. Awesome. Good to have yeah, you. Yeah. Let's 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 circle back to that uh, Baron when we when we hit up Panasonic. So for mm, me, yeah. that's the deal. Maybe the A7S three is going to be the camera that pulls me to Sony. That's probably the closest contender for me right now. Yeah. To switch away from Panasonic. Um, now let's move on to Canon. We're already 24 minutes into the show, so we're going to have to pick things up here if we're going to score yes. and get through all these different brands. So um, do we skip you two since you're already there? Or no, Canon? Let's, let's go over Let's go over what Canon has to do to keep you, what Canon has okay. to do to keep you, 
uh, and then we'll fly through this canon stuff. All right. Ben. Me? Uh, yeah, so like, now like, with this assumption that we've got the money to, to just jump into any system, I still I love the C200 still. It, it's just a great workhorse. Uh, the the image of it's still great, and the even with the the eight bit internal, it's still great and kind of performs better than the spec of that codec would have you believe. Um, I and I still like the R. I know it gets maligned enormously, but I really like that camera. And it's not got the great this dynamic range, but I kind of you know, kind of learnt my trade shooting on velvet which had like something like four stops you know it, the, the whole thing is workaroundable if you know what you're dealing with it's fine um but i like the camera i love the af on it i find as a b cam it works really nicely i can get it to match pretty well with with the c200 so right now i'm kind of happy the new cameras are obviously disappointing as i drunkenly ranted on about enormously last week apologies everybody mm. but uh, uh, right now that hasn't pissed me off enough to to, to be jumping ship the Sony offering's great, but but in a practical sense, I'm not really there. You know, I'm very invested in glass and all the rest of it. I know when we're talking about this hypothetical situation, um, if we were jumping, if we were going from scratch, possibly Sony, right now. But for to, to really in the real world right now, you know, Canon have still got me for now. Interesting. That's nice. Where we are. Jim, um, Canon. So what do they got to keep? keep you happy for the next three years well it's a hard one if i take digital cinema cameras out of the equation i don't know what's going to pull me away from fuji film right now um right even though i like full frame you know i will agree with ben that there's always secret sauce in canon cameras to me it's really what happens when i take that camera we'll take the r6 as the example and when i'm shooting in 4k 24 which doesn't have the fine or hq mode on that camera um am i happy with that 4k image is it sharp enough for what i'm doing is it you know because we can pixel peep all day long on youtube you know with compressed video which is hard to pixel peek you know with but uh peep with what am i saying but the issue is that when you're you're looking at the two images next to each other from two different cameras, you can still see which one is sharper generally, as long as the person operating it wasn't user error. So we can see that uh, fine or HQ in the R5 is definitely sharper than just regular 4K recording. And it looks to be sh a little bit sharper than the A7S 3 though the A7S 3 from what I can see, is a little bit sharper than just the regular 4K recording on the R5 and the R6. But does that really translate in the real world when you're using good quality glass and you're shooting a project with good lighting and, and everything else and camera movement starts to get added to it and you're not just, you know, magnifying a label which has words on it? I don't know. That's really the question. I mean, look, the C300 Mark II is not the sharpest camera in the world. People have been producing beautiful content on that camera for a long time. The question is, you know, what can I do with the camera? We've got 10-bit. We've got decent data rates. So um, for me, it would be, do I like the usability of the camera? And is the image sharp enough? And can I do enough with it in post that I'm happy with it? And I think that that would probably be the things that could say, okay, I could go to the EOS R family and system because there are advantages to it. You know, especially the whole RF to EF adaptability, you know, being able to use ND filters between the lens and the camera body. Um, they're weak in the audio side of things compared to Sony, for sure. But um, I still think that in the end, people are going to be making some really beautiful images with it. And there's going to be a lot of people shooting 24 and 30 with these cameras more than anything else. So trust me, there's going to be a lot of video coming out of the R6 and the R5, regardless of what people are talking about, um, you know, over the last couple of weeks. That's what I got. Yeah. Um, all right. Canon, for me, uh, I do still have the R6 on pre-order. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm open. I'm, I'm not saying now that this you know, Sony's going to win me over with the a7S three. It looks amazing. Uh, 
Hmm. But uh, like you guys have talked about, when you have a side-by-side -side of the two cameras, yes, you can see one looks better than the other with the same exact shot and the same lens. But uh, to me, it's whether or not it works in the workflow. So I'm going to give the R6 a shot. And yep. uh, if it works for me and the images are good and it doesn't overheat, then I'm, I'm happy and I'm willing to make that jump. Um, lenses for me, I'm kind of in the middle I have some Fuji lenses, some Sony, no, hmm. not like a huge pile of G Master. And I do have a couple Canon lenses, not really any primes, but, you know, 24 to 70, 70 to 200, etc. So I'm kind of in this weird crossroads hmm. area. Um, mm -hmm. So I would be, I mean, we already talked about it. Hands down, cinema, cinema department, uh, Canon is just killing it. So that's that. And yeah. then we're going to have to wait and see when these cameras actually ship, what they're actually like. Um, I, I could see the R6 being like the R, where everyone was furious out of the gate and yeah. slammed everyone. I mean, I, I got so much heat when I did videos on that camera. I remember yep. that. And, uh, and then guess what happened? Yeah. After a year or two, everyone was People on the R. It. Totally. Everybody. Um, so that could happen with the R6. Totally could see yeah. that happening. I uh, agree, so yeah. that's the deal with me is R6, R5 is kind of a massive letdown for me. Um, you yeah. know, it's like you're paying a lot more for not much more uh, given the limitations. So, and I mean, basic things like I need to be able to record at least 30 minutes of footage in one go. Yeah. You know, you just gotta, you gotta be able to use it as a tool in the real world. Yeah. Uh, and, and, Gerald had this whole thing Gerald had done about the real world versus YouTube. And everyone's like, oh, well, in the real world, you only need X, Y, Z. It's a great watch. Um, it is. Go anyway, see that video. It's good. Yeah, I think it was an interview, actually, a podcast. Did you see that, Ben? Yeah. It was, uh, it was like a 30-minute, hour-long thing. Really good watch on uh, Sarah Dietschy's channel. Great channel. Mm -hmm. She's great. Yeah. At any rate, that's the deal with Canon for me. Um, can I just, can I just, I just want to quickly, before we move on from Canon... The, yeah, just referencing some comments in the chat about kind of what's the the, the deal with the the Canon fanboy lenses. I'm not talking about them that they're better than anyone else's lenses. I'm just saying that I have a lot of money tied into them. That's it. Yeah, mm, yeah. that's that's I why we're talking that about too. decisions making. It, it's not it's not about that, that. I feel that Canon's lenses Canon lenses are better than the Sony lenses, or that they're better than any, any other brand. All in, is entirely referencing that. I have thousands and thousands of pounds tied into Canon glass. So a decision to move to another system, you know, it, it's a big deal because you're having to retool everything, you retool up from, yeah. the, from the ground up, which is kind of what we're talking about, I know. But that, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about, you know, investment in glass that we already have. And we have to address that uh, people are like kind of giving Canon a hard time about their lenses and marketing fluff and all that. But here's the thing. Um, they're like... If you're comparing them to like, I don't know, tools, they're the old school brand that's been around for a hundred years. It, you know, everyone has it in their toolbox um, and they just work. They keep working. They're consistent. Uh, and recently with the RF mount, they are doing some stuff that you can't get anywhere else. The size mm -hmm. of the lenses, the features of the lenses. So sure, like Sony and other camera companies, lens companies might be like that Kickstarter thing, that Kickstarter tool that you can buy that's got all these cool features and will brush your teeth for you. But it's not going hmm. to be the thing that has lasted forever. I mean, Ben, you've had your 70 to 200 rebuilt like seven times, right? <laughs> yeah, and I and I you bought can... that lens secondhand. That that yeah, lens keep has going. Got some it's like this chair, Herman stuff. Miller. They're expensive. Yeah. And yeah, people are Aeron. like, why, why don't you just buy one of these cool, yeah, I've got, an, I've got three Aerons. The one I'm sitting in right now, I bought used 15 years ago. Yep. Mm. And if I feel like I need it serviced, you can go anywhere and get it serviced. So it's, there's and, a reason. And also, you know. and also the, in terms of the, the usability of camera lenses, of Canon lenses across a lot of different manufacturers, that's a that's a huge thing you know if you're investing in glass we've talked about this a, a million times on here is that it in my opinion it's still the smart money is EF because you can there's a lot of cameras that are using that natively it's very adaptable onto other things 
Um, you know, you go down the Sony route, and they've got they've got an amazing lens lineup now. But your Tai is not on Sony. There's nothing else you can exactly. use that on. The Sony ES and Nikon, it. which yeah, 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 which is Nikon. which is so what's so attractive about the RF mount, which will keep a lot of exactly. people which there, is. is the fact that you have that short flange distance, but you don't have to be tied to RF as your lens system. You can keep EF as your lens system, which opens up not just Canon as a manufacturer, but you've got amazing lenses by Sigma and other manufacturers out there, to some Tokina stuff and, and other manufacturers. Um, there's some really great glass out there, which can very easily be adapted. So I think, I still think that EF mount lenses are a great investment right now, I think. But Yeah, you know. right. And I've got to make one very last, very quick point on the Canon thing. Yeah. Was the 360 just brought up. The pro support is absolutely outstanding. You you bounce a lens on Monday, you've got that back like a brand new lens by Friday. Well, more or most anywhere in the world. The, the, the CPS setup is just second to none. All right. Nice. Okay. We are 36 minutes in, so we're going to have to pick it up here to hit at least okay. two more brands. That's going to be Fuji and Panasonic. So we're going Fuji. Ben, what would Fuji have to do to get you to switch? Go. Make a cinema camera. <laughs> Down and out. So honestly, huh? that's it. That's it. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, their color's great. There's certain bits of the, that whole stuff that I find slightly gimmicky, but it looks nice. You, know, it's, you, you can get a nice baked-in look straight out of the camera. In terms of workflow, if you're just churning stuff out, if you're doing weddings or something, Fuji's fantastic because you get the look stri straight away your post time is really reduced do a cinema camera as well i'd be i'd be interested in that for sure depending on All the right. kind of work that i had on at the time but i i think i think that's kind of where they're they're lacking in this because we've been talking about the mirrorless as a, as, as b cams to cinema cameras they don't have one so for me it's a bit of an non-starter because the system doesn't doesn't sort of encapsulate that right now but i i love what they're doing um, yeah. you know not in everything you know the the af that gem gems kind of <laughs> every week doesn't sell it to me but you know i love the color in the in those things and, there it uh, is there's the wobble yeah exactly it's like slapping but, a jellyfish <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. and, 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 but, but it, but it has this anomaly it. remember it has the anomaly which Caleb is very well aware of which is I'm not recording right now and if I press record the, the AF system is much it's so dumb um, fix it Fuji yeah come on so uh, ridiculous by the way um, Rabbit Tribble says don't you lose AF with adapted glass sometimes you do sometimes you don't if you're going EF Depends. to RF it's not a problem if you're using some third-party lenses with certain camera systems, you can run into some AF issues. But and, first and, and the, foremost, the Sony yeah. works. It's just not great. You know, it's not amazing. It's not like native, but it does work. But it's that's that's with older Sony cameras for the most part too. And so what we need to see is as we have this evolution in AF, how well that translates when you use third-party lenses and you're adapting them, you know, to to the system. I think. I mean, you know, we'll we'll see. Mm -hmm. Um, what's what? What you, what's a smirk for, Caleb? Are you reading something? Or uh, just you, uh... sh shiz is in the comments, essentially just making up perfect cameras for each brand. <laughs> He's Lovely. like GH six with a super thirty five millimeter sensor and epic, you know, uh, all this great stuff. And now he's talking about Fuji making the perfect camera. Um, um he's I, like, I do want to. You just do this. Uh, let's look. I, we we keep seeing this feed. So what's interesting about today? is I just fired up YouTube as well, and I'm not seeing an issue with the feed, personally. I know you're not, Caleb, when you're looking at it. Some people are. David seems to I'm be having the biggest well, problem. Definitely reload um, the page, obviously, if you haven't tried that already. Yeah, but there's there's definitely, it's either regional or it's a YouTube issue, as far as we can tell, because um, bandwidth-wise, we should be okay to push this out. Um, for me, with Fuji... It's not a huge leap. I agree with Ben. A digital cinema camera would be fantastic. I think Fuji is really close when it comes to AF. You know, um, they're not where Canon is right now, and they're not where uh, Sony is right now. Sony has basically caught up in terms of the AF game, but they're really close. I don't think it takes a lot for Fuji to get their AF system to be as rock solid as both Canon and uh, 
uh, Sony. And what's interesting about that is it's really just those three companies. If you talk about AF systems in digital cinema cameras and in mirrorless cameras, right now it's Canon, it's Sony, and it's Fuji coming in uh, in third, probably. And then everybody else is pretty much dog crap, you know? It's just poo in terms of the AF system, in terms of reliability. Um, I'd love to see a digital cinema camera, even if it was an FS5-ish type of camera. Again, you can just take the internals of what is inside of an X-T4, improve the AF system, a good ND system. Let's get the audio into there with XLR. Obviously, an adapter would be great, but if you're going larger, you don't need to do that. And um, they've already got the magic sauce when it comes to the lenses. The 18 to 55 and the 50 to 135 are just absolute yep. rock stars of lenses. Um, you know, if they took those two lenses and made them slightly larger and did what they could to make those AF enabled lenses, then they would really kill it. If they had a digital cinema camera with those two lenses, which are par focal, they're sharp, they're lightweight, um, that would be a killer system for me. And Absolutely. it would be, that yeah, would nice. be a pretty, that would be a pretty easy leap for me, I think. All right. I'm done. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, you're fine. Uh, <laughs> So for Fuji, for me, uh, I have, you know, I, I love what they're doing. Um, the thing that's kept me back is it's so great, but there's some stuff that just really bugs me. Um, little things like the, the focus wobble. They're, yep. just, they're, they're, in a, they're in a distant third, I would say, in focus. Yeah, I agree. When it comes to video, there it is. You, do, you, you know exactly how to trigger it, too. A uh, distant third, um, dumb stuff like you a, a glitch where you have to hit record to get good autofocus. Autofocus when you're just in standby versus recording, completely different. So fix that stuff so you can live stream and have, you know, <laughs> decent focus. Um, their lenses, they're great, but I feel like there's not nearly as much options. If you go to Sony, you have all of Sony's lenses mm -hmm. and... You have uh, third-party lenses like Sigma, huge line. Mm. Uh, Tamron has been killing it with their zooms. You can buy a totally. full zoom set, save thousands and thousands of dollars, and have perfect AF, great image. Canon, same thing. So uh, Fuji, open up your you know mount technology, the electronics, give that stuff to Sigma and others so they can produce lenses. Um. And just quirks, just weird stuff that, you know, only Fuji has. Uh, so that's getting into Panasonic land, why I like Panasonic so much. But um, that's the deal with me and Fuji. Really love what they're doing. Just for me personally and my workflow, ugh, not quite there for me. Yeah, um, uh, You hit the right. nail on the head with the lenses. Well, I just want to say you hit the nail on the head with the lenses when it comes to Fujifilm. That is their Achilles heel. Because not only do they have an issue with zoom lenses stepping when you're changing focal length, which to me is a big no-no, and I, I'm relying upon prime lenses 95% of the time that I'm using the camera system, unless it's that 18 to 55 and that 50 to 135. Um, but it's, you know, it's a fact that they have not opened it up to third party, and I think that long term that's going to hurt Fuji unless they open it up so that Sigma and Tamron and these other companies can actually make lenses for their cameras, which they would love to do. Trust me. I mean, there's enough X-T3s and X-T4s, whoa, out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's enough of them out Same there point. in the market that uh, that I think that they would produce, their, they would produce lenses for X-Mount, personally. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. yeah. Um, mine was on a far more trivial matter, but I think we've got another T-shirt in our line as well as the you're not getting five axis image stabilization at home. We've now got open up your mount. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. All right, there you go. Uh, Add that boy. to the list. All right, boys and girls, we have uh, 16 minutes left. Um, ben, you're next. We're talking about Panasonic. Jem, uh, you're a beautiful man. With lots of wise words and so much passion. <laughs> Keep but, my mouth uh, shut. Prepare your, prepare your answer. We got to giddy up because I want to hit right. a couple extra, like, one-liners. Ready? Go. Ben. Yes. Panasonic. Uh, 
sort out sort out something around the Eva Eva two. Um, general back end of everything good. Eva one almost there, a bit shit in quite a lot of areas, but used it like the image. Sort it out, make us mark two, then we can have a chat about it. Okay. Sure enough. Sounds good. oh, it's beautiful. Uh, okay. Gem. AF system. There we go. Excellent. <laughs> 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 Anything else to add to that? I'm amazed. <laughs> two words. Look at him. He's shaking. Eva, Eva 2. <laughs> Eva 2 and AF system. And I, I got to come, uh, I got to say, same thing for me. Um, to, for me to stay with them, um, they're going to have to. And I think they will. I think give them a couple years, because, again, that's not like they flip a switch or, or check the checkbox that isn't contrast-based autofocus. That's a big move. Their algorithms are amazing, actually. It's just this, the method of acquiring and testing or checking focus is just slow. And there's no way to fix it unless you move to a different system. So um, for me to stay with Panasonic long term, honestly, if they keep, oops, sorry about that. If they keep going the way they're going and they switch autofocus systems, they're going to be in a great place. Um, They've got a really wonderful thing, I think, going on with Micro Four Thirds, full frame. Uh, the cinema camera, like you guys said, we got to see that EVA too. Um, and that's that for me, for Panasonic. So, now that we've got the big boys covered, wow, mm. look at us. What, what did we do? Two minutes, we went through Panasonic. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, let's hit Black Magic, because I think that's okay. kind of an interesting scenario. So, yeah. Ben... What would it take for you to go to Black Magic? Black Magic are an interesting one because they're kind of a company that I desperately really want to like. Well, I, we, I do like them. I think what they've done and the way they push things on, I think is great. Um, I, at the moment, I think for, for, for paid work stuff, I know there's been some reliability issues. I know that they've got a lot better with that. I don't think there's the, necessarily the support network behind it for if I, if I drop a camera on a Monday... How many days is it going to be until I get that back working again and I can go start earning money again? That's that's one of the big things. But they're, they're so almost there. They've got some great products. Um, they, they have had this slight habit of things being just slightly not quite there usability-wise. They've put the wrong batteries in them or you know, that kind of stuff. But, but they're so close to getting there now with things. I, I think it just put it just kind of growing up as a camera company a bit and, and because we're serious about this we're going to put this into not just the indie filmmakers who tend to be the market that they go for right now but we're going to go after because i think the products there the image stuff them's nice the product's getting better and better put in the backbone put in the support for us um and and i'm interested look i don't know how the af thing can work because obviously they don't make their own lenses they're gonna to have to deal with the party so i'm not sure that'll ever come to that system um but even so, I, I like the company. I kind of have you know, a warm, fuzzy feeling about those guys, and I, I want them to do well, and I want them to get it sorted. But for me to use it, I honestly don't feel that the, that the support's there right now. And the AF, kind of, for me personally, is, is a big deal. I use it. It's, I'm working on my own most of the time. Uh, you know, it, it is a thing. In this day and age, now it's a thing. But I don't know how they can do that because they're not using they're not using their own lenses and I'm not sure how easy that is to get into Canon's kind of um, algorithms for using, using their AF uh, for their own lenses. I suspect very difficult. So that's it. One, two it. great stuff. Like the way they're kind of going. Not quite yeah, there, but agreed. You know, um, gem. Four uh, things, Magic. four things, AF system, boxed based modular design, Cube. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Support from the company. And lastly, nothing to do with Black Magic, but Black Magic Raw support in Final Cut Pro 10. And those are mm-hmm. four things that if they put if those things existed, I would be I would be looking at those cameras very seriously. Black Magic Raw is really interesting to me, but it's far more interesting to me in Final Cut than it is in Resolve because I know Final Cut 
And at the end of yeah. the day, it's about getting work done. And that's what I'm interested in. That's what I got. I, I'd go into into heat over having uh, Black Magic Raw and Final Cut. That'd be very hot. Um, <laughs> I would take me, you to the vet. Uh, take oh care gosh, of that. No, don't say that. <laughs> it's another oh, t-shirt. Geez. Oh, geez. I'll take you to the vet. I'll take Caleb to the uh, vet. Time to take me, Caleb to the vet. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So, Black Magic, <laughs> man, I feel like, like they're on the cuff, right? What they've done during this pandemic with the um, with their switchers, the the A10 Mini, they've got some stuff going on. They churned out three models hmm. um, with amazing features. If they take that uh, that trajectory and apply that to their cinema cameras, primarily their pocket stuff. I think they could be killing it. Um, for me, it's going to be form factor. Not on the Ursa. They've kind of got that figured out. Mm-hmm. Form factor, for sure, on the Black Magic pocket stuff. If they can kind of tweak, like Jem said, boxier design, uh, maybe they just put that amazing menu system and monitor in an external monitor like they already have, which is the video mm-hmm. assists. Mm-hmm. Um, just have a thin panel and a sweet ergonomic body. Take the handle from the Ursa. Stuff like that. I think they're good. Focus agreed. Pretty much what Jam said, honestly, I would go along with. But they're real close, and uh, I just can't use them because I'm on Final Cut. Um, ergonomics are a pain in the butt to work with, so that's the deal with Panasonic for me. And we have nine minutes remaining. Hmm. Any bonus rounds? What do you guys think? I want to hear in the comments. What would it take to you for you to switch to these different brands or switch away from what you're currently working with um anything else we want to add other brands we got through the major ones i feel like it gave back my time that you told me and scolded me that i took away from everybody (laughs) i didn't scold i i encouraged and i didn't mean for you to go down to you know four four words per answer but you know just you know i can do that problem with that (laughs) you're a passionate man you're a passionate man yeah gotta uh yeah, I don't know who 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 else can we talk about. I mean, there's I mean, there's the fringe companies, right? Like there's Zcam, there's Red, there's you know. Wait, can I, I just say something? I want to. I do want to say something about Fuji because they mm. like Panasonic. They straddle Micro Four Thirds and full frame, and Fuji straddles uh, Super Thirty Five and medium format. If they came yeah. out with a digital cinema camera which was natively medium format, but you could flick a switch Ooh. and go and you could flick a switch and go right to super 35. And so it's essentially an X mount medium format, or there's an adapter to go G to X mount or something like that. That would be huge because you could use all of your super 35 millimeter lenses on it, but then you would open up this whole option to basically have this little IMAX camera which I still think mm. they could take. You know, they could have that market, and it would push them no one else into the cinema it. world. Well, it could push them into the cinema world. Well, the only other company that could do it is because they own Hasselblad, Hasselblad is DJI. And I still can't believe, right. speaking of fringe companies when it comes to little cameras, yeah, right. we've, got a, we've got a camera out there that is attached to a drone. They have their own proprietary prime lenses and all of that stuff. And uh, what is it, the Zen Muse system? Yeah. Why haven't we still seen a camera from DJI that is in that yeah. space? Even if they had to take away ProRes RAW, which I don't think they would because they don't give a rat's ass about it, uh, that it's in their camera, you know, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. I want a rocket pack uh, too. Yeah. One thing that you just said that triggered something for me, I never thought of before, but what if. Mm. They came out with a medium format sensor or use one of their mm-hmm. existing ones. Yeah. Put it in a cinema camera. That's, and yep. there's a crop mode that oversamples whatever resolution is with the medium format and gives you a full frame. Oh. Hey. Interesting. I didn't think their about lensing that. Lensing would be interesting, but that yeah. could be kind of a kind of a jab yeah. because there's a but, lot of full it, frame lenses out there 
But if you got the back end of that, that there's a yeah exactly. But if if you and if you had a very modular mount system on it, which a lot of the a lot of companies have managed to do, then you can go from everything from six four five, which is I assume what they would go for is sort of, you know, that that centered that sort of size. Yeah. So you've got all, all the glass, and there's an awful lot of very cheap, very wonderful glass for that sort of system. And then if you're going down to, well, we can then put a full frame on and we can put an EF or whatever else we want to go on there with the, with that and either and then be using a window, a portion of that sensor. If you've got the resolution on it, which those things do, and you've got the back end, you've got the processing power to deal with all of that, yep. that, that could be the most modular, flexible camera going. Yeah, That's very yeah. NX instead of FX mount, and it like mm. is kind of like uh, yep. What was it? The 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 uh, the FZ from Sony, yeah. The yep. flange distance is like negative seven. It's yeah, <laughs> it's like absurd. It's actually behind it. <laughs> yeah, I I think that that would be if they could make a camera for under ten grand that was a medium format sensor with good formats and codecs that is adaptable to other lenses on the market. Um, man, and and like you said, six four five, and you can adapt all those old third party lenses, vintage looks. They could open There's up so a many. whole other market. I don't know how many people are doing that with the GFX one hundred because it does have a short flange distance. I'm sure some people are adapting. It's just there's not enough people shooting medium format that we're hearing about it when we're hearing about these cameras. It's really just full frame APS-C and Super thirty five. And, and you also have idea. medium medium format lenses with AF. I mean, they're all hopeless and terrible the way sure, the AF systems sure. work on all of those. But it's a but, cinema you know. camera, so it kind of gets a pass. Yeah, well, it, it does. Gets a pass. It, it, yeah. will be, it will be interesting to see that it, what the capabilities are of those lenses because, you know, you're still talking about... Oh, I need to change the battery on my light. But if you're, if you're <laughs> talking about Canon lenses where you're, you, my really old CT100, uh, so 7200 that you referenced earlier... Hmm. That that the AF on that is so good on the EOS R with an adapter because the cameras have changed th things on. So I, these right. AF lenses that are made for the medium format system and the six four five system now, which work terribly because it's it's kind of an afterthought in those cameras. Hmm. They're, they're, it will be interesting to see what could be done with that in terms of a cinema camera that was taking AF seriously. Because the uh, the people who are buying six four five cameras, it's a very manual world, and the way that those things are, are being used, it's not really a priority. Sure. I don't know. There's possibilities. Um, it's interesting. Absolutely, very very interesting to think about. Uh, Leo, a while back in the chat, mentioned Sigma FP, uh, mm. and I just want to drop a note and say, for their first forte into this modern mirrorless with video features land. The Sigma FP is the best first camera ever. Yes. Hmm. I'm, I'm yes. just going to say it. No other company has come out swinging like that with a camera like that. It's definitely got some growing pains, and it's got some updates coming that will improve it. But I am definitely keeping a pulse, a finger on the pulse of Sigma, because that's a pretty interesting yeah. first move. I hope they don't stop making cameras with the whole coalition, you know, with L mount, with Panasonic, Sigma, and um, why I'm going brain farty. Who's the third company? Leica, right? Leica, so yeah. Leica. Leica. Yep. Um, you know, we talk hope about French that companies. it's <laughs> yeah. Talk mm -hmm. about French mm -hmm. companies. I just hope that Sigma continues to make it because it is. It's really a version two camera, and and of course with the firmware update, that's really true. Their Achilles heel is cinema DNG, in my opinion. I mean, there's other issues, AF being one of them. It's an expectation now in the cameras. But man, there's just so much about that camera to love. And if they could get the formats and the recording formats right inside of that camera, then I think, you know, along with a, a decent, forget about decent, we're past decent, a great AF system, 
that would be a, a killer little camera that a lot of people would love to have. I'm, I'm still, you know, still really loving what Fujifilm is doing with film simulations. When you talk about Rec. 709, mm -hmm. they're doing it better than anybody, and it makes the most sense to a user once they understand the workflow instead of going to a menu and choosing, you know, these different gamma and gamuts when you're trying to figure out how to get the image that you want. But uh, I agree with you. Sigma FP is a, a home run for a first camera. It's just unfortunate <clears throat> that they're not going to sell a lot yeah. of them. You know. Yeah. Uh, and I will. I was going to say it, and then Lover Tech jumped in. Uh, the Sigma FP is the only camera on the planet that will be able to do see it Cinema DNG, Black Magic Raw, and yep. ProRes Raw. Yeah. Which, what does that not cover? It's absurd. Yeah, and forget um, the Cinema DNG. Just get either yeah. the the assist or get the Ninja Five, and go to town. Right. Yep. I mean that's yeah. Depending and on and flavor. Sigma, when it comes to just good old four two two ten bit internal, unfortunately the camera can't do that because of its yep. size. Yeah. Um, mm. but Sigma has said that they're gonna work on something else. So, man, excited to see what happens with them. It and is. And with that, it is six colon zero zero at least here in the Midwest. Um, good time. We got a lot covered. So we well did. done, gentlemen. Man, yes. We didn't get every company in the planet, but we hit the big ones and a couple fringe companies. Uh, crazy times. So uh, we will see you all next week, same time, here at youtube.com slash the C47. Uh, any final parting words, Ben? No, this was fun, and I was amazed that we didn't end up repeating ourselves for every single brand, which I feared would be what I would do, just repeat <laughs> the same stuff. But we actually drilled down. That was that was a good a good choice of uh, topic this week. Well done. Mm. Nice. Jem. Uh, next week, we have Ben hosting duties. We're shifting gears. It's going to be staying motivated and creative in hashtag 2020 so the idea it's already posted up on the site it was going to be today's episode but we switched it up because it seemed more relevant to talk about mirrorless cameras and i think it's an important discussion uh i for one are going to come in transparent candid and just kind of open book about my thoughts on the first six months of 2020 going into well seven months uh, of the year and just sort of what I'm doing personally to do that. And we hope that the chat is in that conversation. I think it's a good topic. I think it's something we can talk about. And if we don't have enough to talk about with that topic, then Ben will steer us back to talking about gear and kit and all that kind of stuff. That's it. That's what I got. Lovely to spend time with everybody. That's been fun. Mm, definitely. So, to all of you wild, beautiful folks in the chat, thank you for joining us. Uh, love seeing you guys go to town. I'm sorry we didn't get as much time to spend with you in the chat. Uh, so maybe we'll cover more of that stuff in a future episode. Hope you have a wonderful evening, and we will see you uh, next week. Have a good night. Yep. Thanks for the super chats, everybody. See you next week. Take night care. All. Bye.